a good day everyone and welcome to this NPTEL online certification course on biological process design for wastewater treatment. So, in the previous lecture we started understanding how to determine the characteristics of the wastewater. So, as to further determine whether how to go ahead with the treatment of the wastewater itself. So, we learned in the previous lecture that there are may be different constituents which may be present in the water which make them uh, unusable for various applications and these characteristics include the presence of biologically treatable organic molecules, untreatable molecules including heavy metals, refractory organics as well as other types of uh, pathogens etcetera which may be present in the water. So, overall the water, waste water may be uh, characterized in different parameters and these parameters may be clubbed together as physical water quality parameters, chemical water quality parameters, biological or biochemical water quality parameters and pathological water quality parameters. So, in the previous lecture we studied regarding the physical water quality parameters including temperature, specific conductivity, then color, turbidity. To in today's lecture we are going to start with another physical water quality parameter which is called as solid. The total solids is one of the important parameters which is evaluated for any water sample and the total solid includes the suspended solid as well as the dissolved solid. So, total solid is one of the parameters. The quantity of total solid in a water sample can be determined by evaporating the water and weighing the residue. This is very simple technique and the evaporation takes place at 105 degree centigrade and thus we can determine the residue and from the residue we can find out the total solid. Now, total solid will include both suspended solid as well as dissolved solid. So, that means we should be able to find out the suspended and dissolved solids also individually. The quantity of suspended solids is determined by filtering the water sample through filter paper and followed by drying the filter paper and weighing the solids. So, this is that means we can find out the suspended solid via filtering the solid in the water through a filter paper. So, this filter paper characteristics are fixed, generally this is Wattman filter paper number is also fixed for this and what after filtering we measure the solid which is actually being filtered, thus we can determine the suspended solid. Similarly, the quantity of dissolved solids including the colloidal solid is determined by evaporating the filtered water obtained from the suspended solid test. So, whatever filtrate we are getting, we again evaporate that filtrate and weighing the residue. So, we can find out the dissolved solid which was actually not filtered by the filter paper. So, the, this way we can find out the dissolved solid also. So, we can find out total solid, suspended solid, dissolved solid now. Further, the total solids can be considered as some of organic and inorganic solids also. There are two ways of total solids. Now, total solids, one way is total solid is equal to sum of suspended plus dissolved solid. Okay. So, this is, uh, this is one classification and then there is another classification is that total solid is equal to organic solid plus inorganic solid. So, this this is another classification. Now, the suspended solid this is called T s, the suspended solids are called T s s, the dissolved solids are called T d s. So, this also we must know. The quantity of inorganic solids inside any water or waste water sample can be determined by fusing the residue of total solids in a muffle furnace and weighing the fused residue. So, what are the steps? First, we have to evaporate the water. So, total water will be evaporating, so we will be getting total solid. After that, the total solid has to be fused in the muffle furnace at some particular temperature 
So, organic content of the total solid will go off and only inorganic content will remain inside the Muffel furnace and by weighing the fused residue we can determine the inorganic solid and by the difference between total solid and inorganic solid we can get, get the total amount of organic solid and this organic solid is highly helpful because this organic solid will be easily biodegradable and depending upon that what is the amount of total organic solid presence inside the water sample per liter of the sample or anything, then we can know beforehand that whether we should go for biological treatment of wastewater or not. If suppose the inorganic content is very high, then that means we have to go for physico chemical treatment of wastewater more as compared to biological treatment of water. And also we can tentatively determine that what is the amount of sludge and other things which will be produced when we are going only for physico chemical treatment of wastewater. So, the suspended solids or the total dissolved solid they can be classified into different categories. Suspended solid themselves can be classified as volatile or inert oblique fixed. So, volatile solids are those like algae and bacteria which are organic in nature and within suspended solid may be we may have inert and fixed also. Inert material may include clay, silt etcetera which will not be biodegradable. So, within the total solid are TSS we have first total solid, then we have total suspended solid, total dissolved solid, total suspended solid may be volatile suspended solid and non-volatile, non-volatile means inert suspended solid. So, this is non-volatile SS. Now, this VSS actually is the one which can be biodegradable. So, this is this gives an idea that whether we should go for biological treatment of biodegradable fraction of this total suspended solid. So, this VSS is very important. General SS value for different water sample is like if the suspended solid is 0, it is clear ground water. If for sewage, it may be up to 300 milligram per liter. For monsoon river, the amount of suspended solids is very high 1000 milligram per liter or more also. For food industry wastewater the solid sample may be up to 1 lakh milligram per liter also. So, different types of wastewater may have different values of SS inside them. Now, uh, this is again a characteristics with respect to TDS the total dissolved solid which was given here. The total dissolved solid range may also vary for different types of wastewater. Now, for fresh water the TDS may be up to 0 to 1000 milligram per liter. For slightly saline water the TDS is 1000 to 3000 milligram per liter. For moderately saline water it is 3000 to 10,000. For very saline water 10,000 to 35,000 and for brine or for like sea water it is 35,000 or greater. So, TDS value is very important. For our drinking purpose like we use measurement of TDS, generally people measure TDS only via measurement of specific conductivity. Uh, we can drink water up to TDS range of 250 milligram per liter very easily. And in fact, we should drink water, we should have a TDS of around 150 to 200 milligram per liter. But the RO water that we drink uh, generally has TDS of around 80 milligram per liter, uh, which is not good for our health. So, we should always try to use water sample which has TDS of more than 150 milligram per liter, maybe up to 250 milligram per liter for our drinking uh, daily and it will help in maintaining the nutrients inside our body up to a optimum level. Otherwise, if we are using TDS of 80 milligram per liter, uh, the minerals we are not getting and then uh, we have to uh, 
uh, eat other types of uh, pharmaceutics for maintaining those level of minerals inside our body. Going further, there are chemical water quality parameters also. There are different types of chemical water quality parameters and few of them are listed here and then further uh, they, there are other water quality parameters also. So, first and foremost is the pH, pH is the most important parameter and for water quality and the pH affects the solubility of various solid compounds inside the water sample. Similarly, pH affects the solubility of gases uh, inside the water sample. So, pH is the most important parameter. Generally, we wish to have the treated water pH around 7, which is the neutral pH, okay. but wastewaters which are generated in industry may have pH up to 0.5 also. There are some industries which generate water having pH of 0.5. Generally, they will be generating wastewater in the pH range of 5 to maybe 10, but some industries generate water which is highly acidic, highly basic, but after treatment we always the water to be at pH 7. So, pH has lot of importance, you will have to refer to my other lecture for understanding this which has been given in the another course on physico chemical treatment of wastewater. Now, hardness is another parameter which is comes under the category of chemical water quality parameter. Now, hardness may be temporary and it may be permanent and this may be because of calcium and generally the hardness is because of calcium and magnesium and this calcium and magnesium are cation, but certainly anions will also be associated with this. So, calcium along with calcium magnesium, the carbonate whether it is carbonate hardness or non-carbonate hardness that will also be there. So, we have hardness which can be defined in various categories uh, that means it, it includes temporary hardness, then it includes permanent hardness. So, that is there, then it may be carbonate hardness and non-carbonate hardness. So, there are various chemical water quality parameters that can be determined uh, within the hardness through this. For that doing these parameters assessment, we need to find out the ion balance and through ion balance we can check. So, what is done basically is that we try to find out different types of cations inside the water and similarly we try to find out the different types of anions present inside the water sample. The cations which are generally found out very commonly are calcium, okay, magnesium, then sodium, these are potassium, uh, there are many other cations may be formed. Similarly, anions also are different types may be formed like CO3 2 minus, HCO3 2 minus, then we have chloride which has to find out sulphate, then nitrate. So, different types of cations and anions are determine. After their determination, their values are will be generally in milligram per liter. So, both the values will be in milligram per liter. Later on, what we do is that we convert the values in milli equivalent per liter using the valency approach. So, if we find out in milli equivalent per liter, we try to measure the amount of cations in milli equivalent per liter, total amount of cations and total amount of anions also. The difference if there is more than 5 percent error is there in the balance between cations and anions, then that means we are missing either some cation or anion and we have to determine other major cation. It may be possible that water may contain may be arsenic, may be cadmium and in higher concentration, but we are missing that. So, we have to make a ion balance, then only our chemical water quality parameters have been properly determined and 
all the different types of cation and anions have been determined. Once we have determined all these concentrations of cation and anions in detail in terms of milli equivalent per liter, we can determine many other parameters related to irrigation and other things. Similarly, the determination of alkalinity is another chemical water parameter that has to be determined properly. Generally, people perceive that alkalinity measures only OH minus concentration. This is not so. This is not directly related to pH. It is related to pH, but it is not only related to pH. Alkalinity measures all other anionic parameters which can actually neutralize the H plus ions if they are added inside the water. And these parameters may include uh, carbonate ions, bicarbonate ions, etcetera, and all these anions. So, all some of these anions minus H plus ion actually gives an idea that how much acid if you added to the water will be neutralized. So, alkalinity is a parameter which actually measures the tendency of water not to change its pH when acid is added, because when acid is added H plus actually reacts with other types of anions presence in the water and thus the pH does not decrease, though we are adding the acid but this acid is getting reacted with carbonate ion or bicarbonate ion to form the as respective acid. Thus, the concentration of H plus is not increasing and thus the pH value will not change. So, it is alkalinity is like a buffering capacity of water with respect to change in pH. So, determination of alkalinity is very important. Also, alkalinity helps in certain reactions which happen during coagulation and flocculation. And if alkalinity is not present, the coagulation reaction will never happen. So, under those conditions, we have to add alkalinity from outside. So, then only we can treat the water via coagulation flocculation. So, alkalinity is important parameter that needs to be determined under chemical water quality parameter. Similarly, sodium, potassium, iron, manganese, etcetera, sulphate, chloride, already I have discussed here that all these parameters have to be determined for essentially totally determining the water quality parameter. And if the ion balance is not matching, we have to go on determining other ions which we may be missing and these ions may be any of the heavy metals also. So, it may be cadmium, it may be zinc, it may be arsenic, it may be other toxic parameters which may be missing. And when we determine all these parameters, then only uh, we can tell that all the water quality parameters have been properly reported. Now, within beyond this, nitrogen is also a very important element that has to be determined and this the nitrogen may be determined in terms of various parameters. One is like total nitrogen, then total organic nitrogen, total ammonical nitrogen, the nitrogen which is present in the form of ammonia etcetera. So, there are different types of nitrogen parameters that have to be reported for various water samples including those for wastewater generated from fertilizer industry in particular. So, we have to determine various nitrogen parameters for understanding the chemical water parameter of a fertilizer industry where urea, ammonia, etcetera are being produced. Going further, uh, there are chemical water quality parameters, n number of chemical water quality parameters, but all are not reported until unless uh, they are asked by the person concerned. We generally determine few only water quality parameters which are reported here like pH, hardness, etcetera, but other water quality parameters may be determined, may not be de determined depending upon that from which source the wastewater is getting generated, which is the industry, because for various types of industries, the 
Central Pollution Control Board etcetera have specified already for industry specific which water quality parameters have to be essentially determined. So, uh, this is like for tannery the cadmium has to be determined whereas, it may not be necessary to determine it from a textile effluent. So, depending upon the effluent which is generated from different industries the chemical water quality parameters vary. Also as per the MINAS there is a one MINAS standard which is called minimal national standard for various water quality parameters of which are industry specific. So, this is MINAS standards. So, minimum water quality parameters. So, what is the quantity it is reported under this uh, MINAS and we can determine the uh, MINAS for different industries within India and there also it is reported the which chemical water quality parameter have to be determined. So, we can go and understand and determine all those water quality parameters. Now, going further uh, biological water quality parameter is the third category of chemical water quality parameter that we have to understand and this is more important for us of wherever we are going for biological treatment of waste water. So, the biological water quality parameter is essentially because of the presence of organic matter inside the water. When this organic matter is present certainly this organic will degrade with time and when it the degradation happens inside any uh, water then the oxygen which is present inside the water actually is used up for degradation and thus the oxygen depletion happened. So, we want to know beforehand that what will be the total oxygen demand of the water sample or the organic present in the water sample. So, there are three different types ways in which we can measure the oxygen demand. One is called chemical oxygen demand, another is called biological oxygen demand which is also called or BOD, chemical oxygen demand is called COD. Then there is a called theoretical oxygen demand which is more theoretical in nature. There is no need for any determination via any of the testing methods which is called THOD and in place of that we can also determine the total organic carbon because if the total organic carbon is known to us we can know that what will be the oxygen demand. So, through that way we can measure the amount of any of these parameters. Now, the basic logic here is that that here uh, suppose any compound is there C X H Y O Z okay, this is some organic compound. Now, when the degradation will happen actually this will under aerobic condition this will degrade into C O 2 and H 2 O. Now, via balance we can do some alteration to find out like X is there this will be y and we can easily determine what is the coefficient here. Now, in the oxygen demand actually we are measuring this that what is the oxygen demand that will be there for degradation of this compound ultimately inside the water. When we are measuring organic carbon we are essentially measuring this that what is the amount of organic carbon inside this. So, certainly there may be essential some relationship between oxygen and this organic carbon. So, this is TOC is like a pseudo parameter of a oxygen demand. So, total organic carbon can also be determined and reported. So, now we are going to study all these parameters in detail and uh, because this is determination of all these parameters is essential for understanding whether we should follow the biological wastewater treatment or not. So, we will start with the COD first. The COD of an organic compound represents the amount of oxygen that is required to oxidize the substance to carbon dioxide and water. So, this is the same reaction that was given here. The difference between COD and BOD is that in the BOD only microorganisms are involved for degradation 
whereas in the COD we assume that we can use some highly oxidizing chemical for oxidizing the compound into CO2 and water. So, CO2 analysis actually in the during COD analysis we measure the chemical oxidation by dichromate. Okay. So, dichromate is highly oxidizing compound and thus the majority of organic matter present in the sample will be oxidized. COD measurements are needed for mass balance in wastewater treatment, we will understand that further. The COT content can be subdivided in fractions useful for consideration in relation to the design of treatment processes, I will understand this. A COD measurements with per magnet measures a part of the organic matter and should only be in relation to planning the BOD analysis. So, when we are measuring with dichromate, we are measuring all the oxidation, whereas when we are measuring with per magnet, it tentatively gives re in relationship false BO COD with respect to BOD analysis. Now, how the COD analysis is performed? This test is carried out on the waste water to determine the extent of readily oxidizable organic matter and which may be two types it may be biologically active and biologically inactive. So, organic matter which is can be oxidized by microorganism is called biologically active, which cannot be oxidized biologically via microorganism is called biologically inactive. So, actually COD will determine both, whereas if we are measuring BOD that will be understood then later on it will be only focusing on this, it cannot determine the biologically inactive organic compounds. So, this is there. So, COD gives the oxygen required for the complete oxidation of both biodegradable and non-biodegradable matter, whereas BOD gives only the oxygen required by the biodegradable matter. So, COD is a measure of oxygen equivalent of the organic matter content of a sample that is uh, susceptible to oxidation by a strong chemical oxidant like, like this dichromate. We can use the per magnet also, but it would not be giving the false COD. It is an indirect method to measure the amount of organic compounds present in the water. Generally, it is expressed in milligram per liter, which indicates the mass of oxygen consumed per liter of the solution. So, this is the mass of oxygen consumed per liter of the solution. Now, the analytical in the analytical method, what we do is that organic compound in depending upon the oxidizing agent, it will convert into CO2, H2, etcetera. So, dichromate a sample is reflected in a strong acidic solution with a known excess. So, what we do you know we know beforehand that what is the potassium dichromate we are using. After digestion the remaining unreduced potassium dichromate is titrated with ferrous ammonium sulphate to, de to determine the amount of the potassium dichromate which has been consumed. And this oxidizable matter is calculated in terms of oxygen equivalent. This procedure actually the titration procedure or the refluxing and titration procedure is applicable for COD values in the range of 40 to 400 milligram per liter, it gives very good results. If the values are higher, we have to dilute the sample to keep them in this range. Okay. So, through this we can determine the value of COD. Now, uh, let us take an example to further understand the COD. A COD test was conducted on a wastewater sample. In the test, there are 2 ml of 4 millimolar solution of potassium dichromate and 2 ml of a wastewater sample are added. So, this at the end of the test, the residual concentration of dichromate was found to be 0.2 millimolar. Earlier before that it was 4 millimolar, after that it was 0.2 millimolar. Calculate the COD of the wastewater as milligram COD per liter. So, this is the process via which we can 
determined it is explained here. So, according to the reaction, so the same reaction we can write in detail which was given he earlier. We can see here that the 1 mole of dichromate consumed corresponding to 1.5 mole of COD. So, we can easily calculate. So, from this 1 mole of this and we can determine the initial dichromate solution is present as 2 ml volume, while the volume at the end of the test is 4 ml. Therefore, the amount of dichromate which is consumed is 4 into 10 raise to minus 3 mole per liter, because it is millimolar which was given we can see here 4 millimolar. Okay. And this is multiplied by the volume of sample this is as 2 ml and after the sample again the molarity was only 0.2 millimolar and but the sample volume taken was 4. So, overall the difference is coming out to be 7.2 into 10 raise to 6 mole. This corresponds to 10.8 into 10 raise to minus 6 mole of COD because this is already known to us that this is the particular 1.5 times the COD. Now, this COD is present in 2 ml of waste water because we had taken only 2 ml of. So, the COD concentration in the waste water sample can be determined because this 1 mole of dichromate which was actually we had 7.2 into 10 raise to 6 mole of dichromate which was consumed and which is equivalent to this much COD. Now, this much COD is present in only 2 ml sample. So, thus we can determine 2 5 into 5.4 into 10 raise to minus 3 mole of COD per liter and which is equal to 172.8 mole of COD per liter. So, through that we can determine the value of COD. So, this wastewater sample is having a COD of 172.8 milligram per liter. Uh, next lecture onwards uh, we will go further and understand how to determine BOD, TOC and THOD. So, we will continue further. Thank you very much.